Right. Um, so we were we're talking about just things that we figured would be beneficial, and, and um, one of the things Gina and I teach together uh, at Boston have been on his brass staff now since 2010, and uh, probably two or three years after that, he started to come to Johnson. He would fly down and help us out uh, throughout the course of the fall, and. Um, you know, you get to just talking about different ways that clinicians and mentors, you can utilize them in your program and uh, just kind of sharing a little bit about what we do and, um, you know, he has worked with a lot of other BAM programs. So it's kind of, it's real informal, get some slides and some videos just to talk a little bit about um, ways that clinicians have worked and, and things both of us have gone out and, and I've also served in that role and, um, you know, just ideas that you may, uh, you may not have thought of or different ways if you have limited resources financially, uh, things like that, and, and even ways that you can help out uh, other programs uh, yourself and kind of serve in that role if they don't have it. So um, just kind of the, the, this understanding and um, in the last session we were just talking upstairs um, in Saucedo's clinic a lot about mentorship uh, and the idea that these clinicians um, also serve as, as um, you know, ways to continue professional development for you, not just your kids. A lot of times you bring them in to help fix the band or help fix the player, um, but it ends up being something for you to be able to get stronger. So, um, you know, I really like this quote and this idea that, um, you know, if you've been able to see further than others, a lot of times, you know, it's because you've had help from somebody that's really strong uh, or background uh, in, in that and, and being able to learn from somebody um, that you look up to or somebody that, that mentors you throughout either a year uh, or longer. And a lot of times, and, and I'm finding this as I'm getting older a little bit in the profession, that um, a lot of times mentorship starts and you do it for a year or two and then you kind of, uh, you don't do it anymore. Uh, and, and, and a lot of the directors in Texas that I've watched, they're, they're close to retirement and they still bring in mentors, uh, at least the successful ones do, uh, on a monthly basis or a bi-weekly basis to continue their professional development uh, so that, that they can continue to get stronger as, as teachers. So, um, you know, it's just this idea that uh, you, you're constantly, you know, these are my, my probably my two best mentors, um, you know, would be Gino and then Tom Bennett, uh, who, who is from Texas. And, um, you know, they both approach concert and marching band very differently. Uh, and I've been able to learn a lot from, from both. Uh, and, and I feel like, um, you know, that's benefited the program. It's benefited Boston. Uh, it's helped my own understanding of, of multiple ways to do stuff. So um, I think that that's really, um, you know, the gist of where this is, is, is finding that uh, and, and how to use that. So I want to talk a little bit about Wayne. I mean, you talked about Wayne last oh. time. And, we were talking upstairs and, uh, you know, uh, Richard Sosedo was doing a wonderful uh, clinic on professionalism and mentorship. And, it's, and I was very fortunate, and, and, I, and I said this upstairs, I was very fortunate and we're not, I think what develops great teachers has to come, th comes through exposures. What have you been exposed to, or most importantly, who you have been exposed to? And to be able to watch that individual and what they're able to share with you. Uh, I was very fortunate enough when I was getting started uh, that I, my, my mentor at the time, this was back in the early 90s, was a gentleman called Wayne Downey who used to run the, the Blue Devil Brass program and made the Blue Devil Brass program to what it is today. <clears throat> Without his leadership and guidance, they wouldn't be where they are today. And obviously now there's, there's young people there that are taking, the, taking that organization and, and, and move it uh, straight along. But I was very fortunate that I was able to work with him uh, for 10 years, you know, and for 10 years we would, we would work together. I was kind of his right-hand man. He was my boss. And, um, and I didn't realize it was going on at the time until Jared and I have these conversations as he brings me in uh, and, and shares his wonderful program with, with me. But I was being mentored at the time, and I didn't even realize it. I was just taking, you know, because I was so young and so inexperienced. But now I look back at that time, and I go, man, how lucky was I to have that kind of exposure to watch such a wonderful teacher every single day? And, and, that, and, you know, and it's not possible for you guys. It's a different setting, and I understand that. But you do, when you start to bring in clinicians or you start to bring out, and you're able to bring out sources from the outside into your program, 
uh, and, and to see how they go about it. it. I know, like for me, I even started taking on a, a few of his mannerisms on how he teaches, just like I'm sure when you're conducting or when, you, you know, when you're watching your college professor conduct, probably you picked up some of his mannerisms uh, and, and, your, and your conducting style. So it's kind of a, a lot like that. So uh, I, th I think this is very vital. And I know it's, um, it can be intimidating at times because you would feel like, well, if I bring in a clinician, that means I don't know what I'm doing. Right? You start to, well, maybe my parents are going to think that that's what they're paying me for. Why do I have to go to my booster club and ask for some money to help, but, uh, you know, for, for a clinician or slash a mentor? Uh, but it doesn't mean that at all. You know, I, I, I do, and I was saying this upstairs too, that to this day, uh, I've been, you know, I've been doing this for quite some time, but to this day, I still seek help. To this day, I still seek knowledge. To this day, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I'm going to all these uh, conferences and, and sticking my head in everything. You know, I'm scared to death. I don't want to be left behind. You know, I do not want to leave, be left behind as a teacher, uh, as an educator. I want to be in the forefront. And um, and, I, and 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 Jarek, you know, does a wonderful job with this in his program. And not because he he, he obviously he has the resources, uh, so he's very fortunate. Uh, but I couldn't stress to you enough that uh, having somebody to bounce ideas off and listening to your program and uh, is uh, is I don't think you, you know it's it's I don't think there's anything better. And and, and you know it's when you look at it with each of you having a different situation because I, I grew up in New Jersey uh, and I, and I, I went to, to college at Rutgers and, and a lot of what we did in South Brunswick where I went to high school. Uh, we, you know, a clinician might have come in once a year or twice a year. So when I moved to Texas, starting to look at the different ways that the private teachers were used, or uh, getting musicians in from the symphony, and you know, financially, there's a what I've studied a lot across the state is is that even the, the, the districts that have the lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, are still finding ways around that, you know, by, you know, if I'm a baritone player, I'm a euphonium player in my district, you know, and I know there's a good trumpet teacher that's at the middle school, I go to that trumpet teacher and I offer and say, look, I'll come over and do, uh, every week I'll do a weekly low brass master class if you come over and work with my trumpets. I can't pay you, you know, you don't have to pay me, I'll do it in exchange. And we still do that in our district, even though we're, you know, we have some of those resources to be able to pay people. Uh, so often, you know, there you can find, um, people like to teach, teach, I mean, you like to teach, teachers enjoy working and con contributing, so, um, you know, these, these uh, clinician or master class opportunities, they really make a difference in your program, and, and you get that at college. I mean, college is one big master class, so when you can start to approach it like that with your high school band or your middle school band, uh, I think that that makes a difference. So, looking at um, <coughs> mentorship areas. Um, when you use the, that term mentor, you know, Gina said it's a lot of times we're embarrassed or we think that we, you know, we bring a mentor in um, that, that uh, we're not good enough. And, and I mean, I, I feel like, you know, what I'm finding in the people that I observe is, is that they, um, a lot of the best directors in colleges are still bringing in people, um, you know, and, and they're a lot, of the, a lot of simple things. So it's like you other successful directors. So, you know, you find programs that you, you look up to or find role models in terms of drum corps. Or, you know, if you're in a state, you know, find some of the best uh, directors that are within an hour of your program. And, and they don't have to be winning BOA or they don't have to be, you know, making superior or whatever. It's not about that. It's about people that... Uh, you believe have something to offer to the kids, and uh, it's again, it's so often you know we think of a, a clinician as having to be somebody that you know has accomplished this, that, or the other. And the reality is, is it's finding somebody that has something to offer you or your students. Uh, and if you can, if you can tap into that, you can tap into what the strength is of that clinician. That's going to make a big difference in your program, and uh, and and you, you're going to learn. So uh, that's why I suggest uh, if you've got a local community band that's in your area, uh, or even one that's you know that's there's going to be 40 players, 30 players in it. You can tap into those players. Ask if you know maybe you can take them out for a couple of beers or buy their dinner or something like that. If they'll come in and they'll help mentor uh, your your trombone section, your clarinets, uh, college students, uh, they'll work for cheeseburgers. Uh, you once did, and, and they will too. Uh, so, you know, bringing them in out of the local colleges, small schools especially, uh, that just to get that exposure to be able to teach. A lot of times, uh, you know, we have people approach Johnson, they say, look, I just want to come in tech. I don't need any money. I, I just want that experience to be able to come in and to help teach marching or something like that. So, you know, being able to go online, there's resources on Facebook and, and on the website uh, about all these, these 
people that are looking for volunteer tech positions. They just want to come out and help. So, you know, whatever that's going to be. And I say think local to save money because if you get somebody that can drive in, uh, obviously we are fortunate in, in, in that we can, we can afford to fly Gino in, but uh, a lot of times um, programs can. And um, he's even going to go to a place this year that we are piggybacking off of because it's a school that doesn't have as much money, so we're going to cover the cost of the flight. Uh, he's going to pick up a little bit of extra money by going out to help, but the reality is, is that it's, it's taking a big burden off of them of not having to get the flight but still get the clinician. So sometimes, you know, finding out maybe if your resources are limited, uh, piggybacking onto somebody else that might be able to share. So uh, you'll never know unless you ask. Um, you know, people say to me all the time, you know, you probably don't have time to come up or, uh, you know, could you come out and listen? And uh, usually I, I, I like it and I don't, um, I don't do it for the money. And I would think you would find that, that there are clinicians that do and they're going to rip you off and they're going to charge you 10 grand for a visit. And uh, that's, you know, what they do. And, but I think more people than not are not going to do that. So, um, and then I think the biggest one that I've tried to do, and this is just personal, uh, I think we all try to, and we all like hope, I think we acknowledge our weaknesses sometimes. Um, but a lot of times that's the, the most insecure, I think, when you're picking a clinician that you don't want to bring in somebody that you feel like, uh, you know, steps on something or maybe you have to expose the fact that you don't know how to do something as well. But ultimately bringing that clinician in is, is what's going to help fix that, you know, and, and, and allowing them to do that. So um, I think that that's a big, a big piece of it. We talk about, um, you know, they come in all shapes and sizes. Again, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, a symphony player, a brass caption head, you know, somebody um, that, that knows a little bit and can add to your program is going to be able to make a difference. So uh, show for us. Um, okay. So this is, uh, this is at Cadets, it's 2013, it's the end of the opener and um, you know, when I went about trying to figure out for me, for clinicians, and um, you know, what we wanted to do is kind of figure out what we like. You know, and he, Gino and I will laugh all the time about the fact that uh, you know, a lot of times a clinician will preach a certain thing and this is the way to do it and this is how you balance. And you know, we're all giving these clinics at, at you know, MFA telling you ideas on things that might work for you. Uh, the reality, though, is, is you got to find what you like, you know, and, and you know, for me, um, I, I liked the cadets, but more than the cadets, I liked the way the brass played. I liked it in college. Uh, I liked the 2000 cadets. That was what kind of got me hooked on it. Uh, I really liked 2001, uh, and I, I, I wanted to know more about how that sound happened. I also grew up listening to the Blue Devils through the 90s and not even knowing who was responsible for that. I had already kind of had a sound in my ear that I liked. So, um, you know, obviously you go and find who's teaching there and who's doing that. Uh, and that was how I started to learn about Gino. So, you know, when you watch this, and then I'm going to show a clip of Johnson, and you know, we try hard to emulate the sound that the drum corps does. Obviously we can't produce it, but I think ultimately, um, you know, when you, you do bring somebody in, um, you know, try to pick their brain as much as possible on how to, that you can get to a certain place, um, you know, because that's how you're going to get the most bang for your buck. You know, if you, you ask them exactly how they do what they do, um, what goes into the sauce, then you, you have a shot at being able to reproduce that. So this is the end of the 13 show, with a 13 opener. This is this is what I pick up when I listen to that. You know, when I when I listen to that sound, listen to that horn line. If I put that against a Carolina Crown, it's a very different sounding horn line. There are two different approaches, two different ways of teaching, uh, and and you put that against a Blue Devils, 
and it sounds different. And you know, I, I, there's a lot of opinions on what's right and how's the way to balance and what. I just know that I really liked that, and I continue to really like that, and I want my bands to sound that way. And that's me as, as the customer and just the director. Uh, and, and so the logical progression uh, would be to try to find out how to do that. And that's a lot of what Gino has done um, both in, in teaching me by working with him, but also with coming in as this, he'll balance something, be able to get it set up, and I watch how he does that and reproduce it. And, and again, it doesn't seem like it's rocket science, but it's definitely a way that um, you know you you find that you can get more of what you want. Uh, other than just asking questions at a symposium. You know, when you ask a lot of times a question here, it's harder to give you that answer. It's easier if you bring Gino in and he stands in front of the brass section. You can watch how he balances the trombones or balances the trumpets or, you know, listen to the things that they react to. I think that that's the part that ends up being the best experience. So this is a little bit from, from us. Uh, and I, I think you hear, I'll show you two clips. I think you see the influence in, in the drill and you hear the influence in the sound. Um, you know, for, for better or for worse. You know, you might like it, you might not, but it's, it's something we're proud of, so. You know, the impact points of a similar balance, it's, it's more top brass heavy, uh, and you'll hear that as we get to the end a little bit too. I, mean, I don't know if you want to talk about like stuff that we do at Boston that is like what you did at the Blue Devils and how you've kind of adapted what you've learned from Wayne to sort of fit what we're doing now, like how it's influenced. Right. I think, um, I think the most important thing, and, and this is the hardest thing, and I, actually I'm going to be doing a clinic on this tomorrow morning, is how do you... How do, you know, how do you know what you want your group to sound like? You know what I mean? Like I always say, like how many of you would spend, like if you're going to do it to Kelly piece or a Whitaker piece or something or a Mackie piece, how many of you, the first thing you do is you go, you probably Google the piece, you find the, the, the best college band that you want to emulate, whether it's UNT or anybody else, uh, and then you listen to that thing, you know, a thousand times, right? What you don't realize is that, or what maybe you do realize, that's putting a sound in your head. You know, that sound is in your head because you're just listening and you're listening and you're listening. So when you get in front of your group, you're, what, you're trying to recreate that sound, okay? But somehow there's a disconnection between concert band and marching band. Uh, and obviously what Jared's been talking about is, is, is the, the, the approach in the brass. You know, for me, 
you know, obviously we have our techniques that we covered yesterday in, in the session and, and there's things that we do to create those sounds. But for me, and maybe it was coming from a quote unquote back in the early 90s, a jazz background uh, with the Blue Devils, I, I created a sound in my head. Uh, or like Jared said, for better or worse, it's the sound that I have. And it's the sound that I want to recreate. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's what, and that's a philosophy that I follow. So when I, whether Jared allows me to get in front of his band or whether I get in front of my own group, I'm, I'm trying to achieve the same sound. When I get in front of uh, Johnson, I'm not trying to create a different sound. I'm trying to create the sound that I know and it's dear and I love, uh, dear to my heart and the, and the sound that I love. So that never changes. I guess for your job or your challenge would be, what's that sound and how do you get it? You see what I'm saying? It's how do you get that sound? What sound are you trying to achieve? You know, uh, and obviously you're you're on you're on a path because you're here. You know, is it is it like Jared just showed you? Is it the cadet sound? Is it the Carolina sound? Is it the Phantom Regiment sound? Is it the Avon sound? Is it the Carmel sound? Is it the Johnson sound? You know, but there has to be an approach that you have to try to go. That's what I like, and that's what I want to be like. Now, how do I do that? That's step number one. You've got to have that sound, whether you're watching videos, whether you're going to shows, uh, or whether you're coming here, or whatever you're doing. But that's the first step. Then after that comes the hard part, <laughs> right? Now, now you've got to recreate that with your students. Maybe they're not as mature, where you're not as fortunate as, as some of us might be, or, or, or vice versa. So, so I, I don't know if that was where you wanted me to head with that. But that's, I think that's the hardest part for all of us is that I know we do it in the concert world. I know you do it in the concert world. I know as soon as you get that new Mackie piece, you, you go listen to you know, Stephen of Austin play it or whatever. Yeah, I know that's what you do, because that's all what, what, what we all do. Uh, but unfortunately, maybe we don't do that so much in the marching band realm. Or, I think we're, we're, I'm taking this in a different direction, or do we, uh, we don't feel maybe it's not as important, or we try to combine the activities, right? We try to recreate what we would create inside, outside, and we confuse everything. And now you're just, you're, you're, you're in a void because you're not quite sure what your sound is. I, mean, I want my group to sound like a wind ensemble outside. Well, it's outside. <laughs> It's going to be harder. <laughs> you know, you, you can't do the things that you do inside, outside. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into that. But, you know, it's, and maybe that's where, to go back to this theme, that's where the cl clinician can help. You know, clinician can help. Well, maybe you can allow your trumpets to play like this. Or did you ever think your low brass could play like this? Or the woodwind choir, did you ever think they could have this sonority? You know, so the more exposure you have, the more resources you can use. Like Jared was saying, even if it's somebody an hour away, man, I would, I would jump on that. I don't know if I would have done that when I was younger. But boy, now knowing what I didn't know, I look back. How many of you look back, some of us are a little bit older than others, you look back 10 years ago and go, I, don't, I didn't know anything, right? But 10 years ago, I thought I knew everything. And now I go, I was dumb. I, I'm embarrassed on some of those groups. I, I, I want to like send apology notes to some of the groups that I got in front of and say, I apologize for teaching you. I didn't know anything. You know, because we learn, we grow as educators. We, we learn, you know, and, uh, you know, and it, it holds true. We, we just don't know what we don't know until you get a little bit older and you have a little bit more experiences and, you, and you've been exposed to, to other teachers. No, I'd, so kind of some nuts and bolts, um, just with us, we, this is for, our, for the kids' sake, they kind of understand the difference for us between a master class and a clinic. Um, we look at master classes as something that's inter, instrument specific. So if we want our oboes to get better, uh, we're, we, the, we're 20 minutes from downtown San Antonio. So the oboist from the symphony, uh, very inexpensive. He enjoys teaching. He comes in and does master classes with the oboe players uh, on fundamentals, on technique. Uh, and, and we usually try to do that once or twice a month. And then some of them take lessons from him. Uh, we might bring in the bass trombonist. It could be pri uh, uh, the 
middle school band director uh, that isn't in our cluster, but she is a really good clarinetist. She comes in and she does a master class once a week. Uh, but for me, uh, our kids have weekly trumpet and clarinet master classes because those are the instruments I'm the weakest at teaching. Uh, I can do a lot of the master classes for trombone and baritone. Uh, in French horn, I'm, I'm pretty good with, uh, but I'm weak at that. And our other woodwind director, he's able to do pretty well with flute and saxophone, but clarinet is his weak spot, uh, and double reed is his weak spot. So that was kind of our fix for that, was getting them that weekly coaching. And with the lower bands, they work on band music. The older ones, they work on that. Uh, you can do... Um, master classes with more pedagogy specific things uh, you know these uh, some of the guys that we bring in they're, they're specifically there uh, to correct deficiencies in the playing trying to help the kids with understanding uh, fundamental tone quality slide technique uh, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good trombone player uh, but I have a harder time articulating how I do it um, so we bring in somebody that's really good about exactly where the slide goes I mean so detailed uh, and last year the cadets used trombones and I felt like uh, you know, with 25 baritone players and only 12 of them had played trombone, so much of what I was able to help that trombone section with was stuff that I learned there. So, you know, again, it becomes that, you know, you learn and you take it and now you've got it to be able to use in your toolbox whenever. Uh, and then, you know, clinics versus the Mastercross with bigger picture stuff. You know, Gino and Tom Bennett uh, and Gary Markham will come in uh, and they'll, you know, Gino will rehearse the entire marching band. Uh, so versus fixing the trumpet section, he's there to do the whole thing. So, you know, different purposes and different times and types of people uh, can offer you different skill sets. And again, you know, there's a price point that's out there for everybody. Uh, you know, you, you might, my pricing um, has been as inexpensive as free uh, or uh, enchiladas, uh, like I said, or a beer. Uh, and if it's a school that's really excited, you know, I think it goes back to, again, if it's a program that is wanting to get better uh, and there's going to be follow through and then I have a good experience there, uh, it, it becomes not about the money if I have the time to do it. Uh, and I know a lot of people um, that are doing this stuff are in the same boat. Uh, and then you have some, again, if you get into a position where you can spend a little bit more money, uh, then that becomes a good thing. Uh, diet or one-time fix, uh, regular clinician, somebody that might come in once a month, twice a month, uh, you set up a schedule, I think it becomes a little bit easier to get into a routine. Uh, you know, the kids know when Gino comes in the kinds of stuff that he's going to do, uh, how we're going to break down a rehearsal. Uh, they know when Mr. Bennett comes in, uh, what the expectation is going to be for that day, uh, and, and we get goals. You know, if it, you know, Gino may go, low brass, the next time I come back, you've got to be able to do that. And the kids get excited about it because it gives them a little bit of a challenge. And, you know, so often, and you laugh because if you've had this experience, you bring the clinician in, they say the exact same thing that you've said 50 times, but when they say it, all of a sudden it works. It's like the magic fix. Uh, and that, I love when that happens. I don't get mad at the kids. I'm like, boy, I'm glad it worked when you said it and I didn't. So you, know, you get to that place where so often it isn't about learning or having them say something different. It is saying the same things. Uh, and you feel good about it because you know you're there or you, know, you make that joke with them. Um, you know, so I think it's just the different types of, of way that you can structure it. So um, one of the things we laugh a lot about is, is preparing the students for a clinic, uh, you know, and, and going out into a place and how to do that. And uh, at Johnson, we, we, and we have some things that are very consistent with the culture of how they rehearse. Uh, we're, we try to have them rehearse as professionally as possible from sixth grade all the way until when they graduate. Uh, and, you know, there's some basic understanding of when somebody is speaking to you, you listen with your eyes. And, you know, if you've never had somebody come in before, though, and the kids are used to you, um, you know, or, or that, I think these are things that we would would advertise. You know, a lot of you would do them. That's great. Uh, this is just what we do. So if you're already doing it, great. I mean, this is stuff that we, we talk to them about uh, and remind them about whenever some, a guest is coming into the house. We use the term guest. Um, and uh, it's, it's talking about being engaged, being active, uh, not being on your phone, not slouching down. I mean, basic respect things uh, that sometimes we take for granted. Uh, but a clinician that's never had an experience with your kids, um, you know, if you have been a, you know, if you've been in front of a group before that's non-responsive or they look disinterested, you know what that feels like. You know, it's it's you're giving them your best and they're staring straight at you and or not at all, uh, and it gets hard to get it done. So, um, you want to talk a little bit about, you know, just your experiences with that. Um, I think if you do bring someone in, I've I've I've. I've done multiple clinics, uh, and my best experience is when the director is prepared to have me, meaning I don't walk into the room and they go to me, <clears throat> what do you want to do? 
<laughs> and I go, uh, I don't know, I, I just met you. I don't know, I just met your program. So if, if the more detailed you are and the more, the more, you have, the more uh, you're detailed about what you want from your clinician, I think the better the day is going to go. Uh, the other thing is sometimes I, I, you know, I've, I've, I've ex experienced many different uncomfortable things um, because sometimes they want to bring somebody in, but they don't know how to bring somebody in. I've had band directors bring me in, put me in front of the group, and they go in their office, lock the door, and go do other, and go do other things so they can catch up on other things. You look at me funny, but it exists. You know, of course you wouldn't do that, but it does exist. So having a plan in mind, like Jared said, preparing the student, because the first thing when Jared says, hey, I, I want you to work with this other group, what's the first thing I always ask? How's classroom management? <laughs> you know, how, how, how does the band rehearse? Uh, because it is challenging, you know, as, as being brand new, you want, you want to get every dollar out of your clinician, right? You want, you, want me to, you want me to work as hard as possible for that three hours, hour and a half, whatever it is, and you don't want silly things to get in the way, whether it's classroom management, whether it's, you know, uh, children on their phone, whether, you know, they weren't ready for me. The band director wasn't ready for me. There wasn't a lesson plan. There wasn't no, you know, there was no goal in mind. So those are, they seem like common sense things, and they are, uh, but uh, you'd be surprised how many people, uh, you know, don't abide, oblige by those things. Yes? So in terms of like lesson plans or goals, uh, as a clinician, work with my band on tone quality, is that enough? Or yeah, that yeah, I don't, I don't, I guess, yeah, it doesn't need to be detailed, <laughs> but here's, here's the clinician, here's the band, see you in a half hour, or see you in 45 minutes. You know, like, hey, man, I, you know, uh, that's a great conversation. Hey, I, you know, I'm just struggling with quality of sound. Anything that you can do, you know, maybe we can spend some extra time. Great, yeah, let me spend 15 minutes on, on tone production or, or something. Any kind of guidance? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it doesn't have to be like a detailed list. You know, I'm, I'm you know, struggling with, with uh, intonation here, or I'm struggling with quality of sound there, or I want, you know, I want, I want my clarinets to be able to articulate better, or whatever it might be. But just always like give it some thought, <laughs> you know. Don't expect the clinician to bail you out. I guess maybe that's that's better said. And I think that that's you know that's a part of it. It's um, you know, when you look at structuring your clinic and how you're going to do it. Um, you know, a lot of times I, I, I get to somewhere where I'm going to try to help, and uh, and they go, okay, here's the score, and you know, and I know that like I think about. Professor Keene and all the years at Illinois that he did and, and he retired a number of years ago and relocated to San Antonio and it's like you know he lives 15 minutes away from Johnson and every once in a while the back door swings open and James Keene walks in in his shirt and his golf shoes and I'm like dude this is bizarre because it's um, you know he doesn't need that if I give him a score to Lincolnshire Posey and he knows he's coming in um, then he's, he, I, I don't need to tell him what to work on. He's just going to put his hands up and go. So I think that there are those situations, and I, and I think that the, um, the, the generation that he's in, um, they, they, they didn't need a lesson plan. Uh, but I know that, that there's so much energy now that goes into teaching band. A lot of times I don't want to step on somebody's toes or they've covered something or they're really passionate about something. Uh, I don't want to um, either beat up something that doesn't need to. So. You know, a lot of times Gina will get here on a, on a Wednesday or Mr. Bennett will come in and we'll sit and talk for 20 minutes about exactly what it is that we want to accomplish during the day. You know, I'll send a video ahead of time and whether they watch it or not, it's still my effort to try to give them an idea of what they're getting into. Um, awkward things that sometimes come up, uh, you know, when you get to a marching rehearsal, who's going to run the rehearsal? Are you going to run it and they're going to give the feedback? And it doesn't seem like it should be awkward, but if you put yourself in, in any position where you're in an unfamiliar environment or you've been out there and it's like, all right, how's this going to work? Who's going to do this? Uh, you know, don't be afraid to kind of say, I'd really like it if you took the microphone. Uh, and then the clinician says, well, can you help do the letters? And sometimes, you know, if it's a rehearsal where uh, I need to get a lot done, you know, Gina will sit and maybe take a little bit of a back seat. Uh, if we've got a lot of time or it's in the mid-season, you know, I'll give him the mic and I'll say, we're taking it from here to here. And then the feedback just comes from him. So, you know, figure that out. And it's obviously the benefits of having somebody regularly come in is, is that you kind of work into a routine. So that gets past that. But, um, I, you know, one of the things that I think, um, obviously you bring somebody in, uh, or if you've been brought in to do a clinic and, and you, you know, somebody asks for your help on something, you know, and, and 
Um, the other director at Johnson is Alan Sharps, and he's been teaching for over 30 years. And uh, a lot of times I, I'll tease him because he's, he's so wise and he's got so much great information, but he still has a tendency when somebody picks on something that he misses, he'll jump on the kids a little bit and go, well, I told them to do that. They're not doing that or this and that. And, you know, he, he is not programmed well to receive clinicians. And he laughs about it. I go, I'm not good with that. I, I, I don't do well with that. You know, but at least he recognizes it and he makes that effort. And, you know, a lot of times you do go in somewhere, you find yourself defending the clinician says something. And, you know, the, the, you know when I go somewhere, Gina does or anybody, the goal is just not to upset you or to offend. But, you know, the best way I think that I can offer is, is just allow them to say what they're going to say. And don't take it personally. You know, they, you know, they can get in there and they can critique it. And, you know, you prepare the kids for that at the beginning, that it's as much an experience for you as it is for them. Uh, and, and allow the clinician to try things. Um, Alan McMurray came in and, and we did a, a, Johnson, my wind ensemble did a clinic at TMEA this year. Uh, and it was all about him trying different musical ideas that are very anti what a lot goes on in Texas. If you know a lot about Texas music, uh, there's kind of a battle that goes back and forth between the technicians that work on Concert F with a metronome very rigidly, and, and there's the whole UIL thing, and, and the guys that are into the music making. And, um, and one of the reasons that they asked to use Johnson was because the kids are so used to having different things that, that when Professor McMurray gets up there, he can do some flexible things. So we're by no means the best players in the state. I mean, I would not ever say that, but something I do think the kids do well is they're very flexible. Uh, and I think somebody different can get up in front of them uh, and, and try something different without the kids going, well, that's not how we do it, or I'm not going to do that, or completely freaking because this guy is not giving any downbeats and he's starting something with a breath. And, um, you know, it, that's not a skill that, that kids come by naturally. Uh, so as much as you can prepare them uh, for anything and, and, and get them excited about doing things differently, um, that's going to give you more. You're going to get more out of a clinician if they feel like they can do something. And uh, that was what Alan McMurray was, was sharing the most with the kids about at the end of it was is just that he appreciated the fact that they, uh, they were so willing to go along with a lot of the different ideas that, that he had. And uh, I'm, I'm probably more proud of that than I am about how they played. Um, because I just think that the flexibility thing and is really applicable beyond what they're doing on the stage. So, you know, go through that stuff. Some, some basic suggestions based on what we do. Uh, if you bring a clinician in for visual, try to put them in something that looks similar. Uh, if it's a white shirt, it doesn't matter if the shirt is something that makes it easier for a visual guy, that's why we do that. Uh, if you can get into a stadium when a clinician comes in, that's beneficial. If you can and you don't have access to it, you obviously make do. But these are just things that, again, you know, if, if uh, uh, you bring somebody to work in, mar in the marching setting, uh, I would say if it's a concert band and the, and the clinician can be in the auditorium, I love it when I go to a school to help a concert band and we've got the hall and I can get back to where, where judges might actually listen or go to different places, uh, you know, that's all going to be a good thing. Um, basic protocol, uh, a, a ready position or a standby uh, or something that the kids are, uh, when they're not alert, um, you know, or they're not being worked with, that they're ready. Uh, I didn't put in here, but, but before we start every clinic, I take a stack of, of paper and I put a sheet of paper on every kid's stand and I do a pencil check, hold up your pencils and highlighters uh, and make sure, um, because again, we're not, I'm not great with that. I'm not, we're not a program where I would bet every day my kids have pencils. Uh, and, I, and obviously, that's, we all know that that's what we're supposed to do. The reality is, is that I don't check every day uh, and, and, and my kids don't number their measures like they're supposed to. So it's like those are all things when I know that somebody's coming in, uh, I try to get all of that stuff ready so that the clinician can work as, as effortlessly as possible. Uh, set position, um, you know, those are, those are things that, you know, again, <coughs> if you don't do them regularly, uh, obviously it may be a little uncomfortable, but somebody that's coming in to work will still appreciate that there's still some basic protocol that's in, in there uh, and, and remind. Uh, be, be ready for weather. Um, you know, and that's, a, it's again, it's, if it's an outdoor rehearsal and you've got somebody coming in, uh, you know, is there something you can still do? Uh, a lot of times marching clinics will happen and there's bad weather. Uh, you know, plan ahead. Maybe you can reschedule the clinic or do, or do something like that. So um, this is something we talk about regularly at dinner, at the bar or wherever, um, that there, um, there's a, a, a great teacher in Texas that made a comment a number of years ago uh, about our horn line and, and, and that he would never ever want my horn line to sound like that. That's just not right. And it's funny because he's a brilliant teacher, but he was 
dead set on that. And, and, and you know, what I laughed about is he proceeded to then come in and come in like 19th and brass that year. Uh, and, and he goes, well, I'd rather be 19th and brass than ever have my horn line play like that. And, and, and I, I've never forgotten that because it was a level of, uh, I won't say arrogance, I don't know how to describe it, but it's just that there's so much of that that I think that goes on that, you know, people look down on the work of someone else and quality is quality, it's like you get that. Um, but, but, you know, when a clinician comes in, um, I, we are careful to bring in people that are not so wrapped up in what they do that, that um, you can't have your own opinion. Uh, or that they come in and maybe dump on what you do. And sometimes when you, when you look for someone that's really good at what they do, they come with a little bit of baggage. You know, this, per, this person was a successful Texas director, an honor band conductor, great state champion marching bands in Texas, and uh, ultimately um, had very strong opinions. Not somebody personally I would want to have in front of the kids um, because it's, it, 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 that's where I think our discomfort, my discomfort would come from, you know, and um, that's the whole thing that uh, my way is if you ask me to come in, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to offer you my way, uh, you know, the Frank Sinatra song that, that again, people are, you are your habit, so your clinician is going to tend to gravitate there, um, but, you know, finding people that um, are not so close-minded uh, can sometimes give you a better experience because they want to work in the framework of what you do uh, and be open to your ideas. So, you want to? Yeah, I mean, I, you, I, I don't think there's much I could add to that. You know, anything that, um, and it goes back with a very opening statement. It doesn't mean that just because you bring something, somebody in, doesn't mean that something's broken. Right? It doesn't mean that something's broken. It just means that we all want to improve. You know, I learned when I go in. I learn too. You know, whether it's Jared's band or anybody, uh, any other band, I learn too. I learn. You know, anytime you get in front of a different group of, of, of students, anytime you get exposed to another band director, uh, you know, I don't have all the answers. So it's it's it, it can it, if you get hooked up in a really nice place. Obviously, with Jared and I, we're very good friends. So it's a little bit different. It's a little unusual, uh, but. Uh, but, you know, the, the, I think what Jerry was leading to, uh, personality has, has a little bit to do with it, too. So, and you find that out. You, you find that out when you bring somebody in. And just because you bring somebody in doesn't mean you have to bring them in again. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? If you bring somebody in, you know, you know what? Thank you very much. I'll call you. Don't call us kind of a thing. Uh, well, because sometimes it doesn't mix, whether it's his personality, the way he treated your children whether he treated uh, your, you know, yourself. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with, but, you know, hopefully you get something out of it. So you're, n you're not locked to anything. You're not locked to anything. You know, they're, they're every we're all self-employed when it comes to that, so. Well, and there's a lot out there. I mean, if you go to the Con Selmer website, we advertise these clinicians. If you go to the BOA website, we tell you these are our preferred clinicians. And uh, I, I would encourage you know, based on my own experiences is go out and, because we, we were not friends before I started to bring him in. And that's a part of where you develop these relationships through having clinicians and through teaching together and that. And, um, and we are now. And I just think that, that, you know, there are great clinicians available. BOA obviously puts the, the, the best teachers in the business, the most successful ones, and they try to find people that are great educators. Um, but your situation is not mine. Uh, and, and that's where sometimes, you know, bringing in somebody, uh, if I taught in a, a rural community and I had 100 kids total in the entire K-12 to music program, uh, I would go, at, I mean, I went up uh, to a town called Arcadia, Ohio when I was in college, uh, and it was a K-12 to school, uh, and I wanted to watch what the band director's Jeff Bright again, I wanted to learn what he did because he was the only music teacher for the whole town. And I just spent three days out there observing. Uh, and what I learned was this is nothing like anything that I've ever seen before. Uh, but Jeff's band was very good. They were competitive in the little 1A thing. And in Texas, uh, Whitesboro High School, uh, Jim Cute is the band director there. And, and he, uh, he just brought his band to Grand Nationals this year. And they, they were in the top three in uh, UIL in the 2A or the 3A class. And uh, they're this little tiny band. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe 25, 30 wins in the, in the section, uh, a couple of color guard and, and, a, and a pit. Uh, and, and he's just been like one of the best that I've seen at, 
you know, making the field look full and getting the, you know, maximizing strengths. And I can tell you, if I had a small band, that would be the person that I'd be calling. I don't know that I'd be bringing in me or Gino or Dick Saucedo or somebody to clinic. I'd go to the guy that has the same type of band that I do. Uh, and, I, and I think that, that that's where we don't always, you know, Music for All, it, it isn't that we're not trying to provide the best, but that's something for you. Um, you know, if I didn't have Gino and I didn't have the connection, I, I try to figure out like, okay, where would I even start to find somebody? Uh, and well, I'd go to the Music for All, I'd go to the Conselmer, and, uh, and that's a great place to start. Um, but the other thing that you can definitely do is, is, is go out and, and just Google, you know, who in Indiana was in, was in Class A, who's in Class D, who's in Class B, and, uh, and start to work from there. And, you know, find the people that have been successful at doing the things that you want. So uh, Keen loves to say uh, a visit from a clinician is like a visit from your family. You're happy when they arrive and you're even more elated when they leave. Uh, and, and he's a big believer in that because he, he's like, I'm going to give you ideas and if you don't like them, you know, you can throw them out. And he goes, I think my ideas are right and you're stupid if you don't use them, but you do whatever you want. And, and I mean, he's, uh, that's just him and, he, and he's really funny about that. But again, it's why I like him because he comes in and he's got a lot of brilliant musical ideas and um, you know, I, there's a, uh, in the middle of La Fiesta Mexicana, the mass, and uh, he, he does it insanely fast. He speeds it up and he gets into the middle of that and he goes, I just like to do that. And, uh, and I adopted it and we ended up using it at UIL and a couple of people have listened to the recording and they were like, why did you make the decision to do that? That doesn't sound right and that doesn't sound how I, uh, you know, it's kind of like when you listen to the Fennell versions of Lincolnshire Posey versus the non-Fennell or some of the other ones and things don't sound right. And just the fact that somebody said, that sounds different, I think it's kind of cool because it's like, well, this is Keen. His bands at Illinois have been amazing. They sound completely different than, you know, what Tom Bennett might have done. He's in the BOA Hall of Fame, but it's, it's a different approach. And, you know, you don't have to be afraid to use different ideas, um, you know, with, with your groups on that. So um, just things for your kids, you know, if, if, again, if you bring somebody in, um, prepare the students that they're going to, the clinicians are going to sometimes preach their word as gospel or gospel. Sometimes they're going to be on that, you know, but the kids, again, they need to be ready for that, that the clinician may say something completely different than you. Well, how does your kid handle that? You know, but ahead of time say, you know, such and such might tell you to shape or phrase something or might conduct a completely different tempo. And uh, I didn't know that when I first started bringing people in. Uh, I didn't know that Tim Ray was going to come in from A&M and we, we were, 40 clicks under tempo on a piece that we were working on and Tim's like, I don't go slower. Downbeat. And he wanted to play it at tempo. And the first clinic, we, we didn't get anything done. But what he was trying to show me is he was coming in three more times. The next time he came in, I knew to have the pieces at tempo. Even if we weren't good at them, uh, I knew he wasn't going to use a met and he was going to want to be at tempo. So we had to prepare for him to come in um, because that's the way that he was going to work. So, um, you know, uh, be a sponge, you know, tell the kids to be a sponge and allow the clinician to, to give you their, um, their expertise on stuff. Uh, this is a big one. Um, sometimes I think that, the, that your choice in clinicians, you bring in somebody that um, is really good at what they do, uh, but as Gina said, maybe they're not as kid friendly. And I think that that's something if you have a way to kind of pre-screen, if you're bringing someone new in and you can pre-screen how they are in front of kids or get some feedback on somebody else that's brought them in, uh, you know, you're, you're interviewing a clinician because if the, if the clinician, um, no offense, if they're, if they're a Ben Stein and they're up in front, uh, you're going to lose out on a lot. You might gain it, but your kids don't gain a lot. So uh, it's, it's, it's that personality of, of how it is. And, um, one of the things you want to, uh, you talk about Thailand, you know, when you go over there, how different that is because of the interpreter and, you know, your personality and what you bring. And oh, gosh, yeah, when I, uh, teaching in Thailand sounds like a really good idea <laughs> until you get there. Um, because teaching for me is, is and, and, you know, it's, 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 um, it's not an act, but there is a rhythm that you get into, right? When you're, when you're on the podium or you're in front of your group, you, you get into this rhythm. I know when I teach, I have to be, I need things a certain way because I want to get into that rhythm that, that I feel I'm more, more uh, successful with. So when you're, when you're teaching overseas, well, you lose, you lose that rhythm because everything you say has to go through an interpreter. 
So no matter how enthusiastic you are, you're, you can go, ah, I said, this is going to be rock. Your interpreter goes, dip, 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 and then it loses that. It, 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 and obviously it's lost in translation, quote unquote. So it is, it, it, you know, it is, a, a little, it is a little bit different. But, um, but I think that's very important. I mean, I think, uh, I think uh, personalities is everything personalities is everything. So like it goes back to what we were saying at the very beginning about your clinicians, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, your, 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 your students are benefiting from them as well. So. Cool. How many, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the things, how many of you have like an organized warm up structure or something that you've either borrowed from a book or somebody that's, um, put it in place for you. I'd just like to get I'd hear a little bit about what what you're doing. Does anybody just want to? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so um, it has like new slur exercises, some much English exercises, um, and excuse me, new exercises for all the woodwinds, like so for flutes, clarinets, and for the brass, and then um, like seven major scales and a chromatic scale. And the drummers have their own thing that they're working on at the same time. So you, so yours actually has percussion. Does it come from a book? No. I you wrote it out. Cool. It takes about three minutes to get through it. It's a bit too long, probably. But it's a, it's a good sequence. Anybody else? Go ahead. I used the, uh, I found this at Model Place. This is a Carol M. Budd's book. Okay. It's an older method book. Uh, you have to create the, the student packets for it. I mean, it's just one book of all the, the, the pages. Um, very technically based. Um, I, I do uh, Remington stuff to start with, and I move to the Budd's book. Um, and then uh, we cover all the scales. We do one scale a week uh, playing test, but then we're building on them as we go. Uh, that's every year for all the classes, the minors in the spring. Um, and that's it. And then in the fall, we have a uh, playing test each week as well and written tests. So we, we may cover some of the stuff in the written test. Cool. Anybody else? Just getting different. Yeah. I've worked with both. There's a book. Um, it's called MVP, Marching It. Uh, it's written by John Mina, Wills, and then we've also tried the Inside the Circle stuff cool. from the Harlots. And so I usually take, I, I like to take bits and pieces from both, and I kind of like make, like make my own illegal book, whatever you want to call it, you know? <laughs> and, you know, so, but you know, really excited. <laughs> take from me and all you want. Okay. Uh, I teach middle school and high school, uh, and a lot of what I do is just try to make a big universal technique packet just for them that's comprehensive and connects through all the years. Uh, so we do a lot of long tone exercises, a lot of flexibility, um, some Remington ascending and descending, uh, a lot of different scale technique stuff that comes from different books like the stamp technique uh, and uh, like the Clark studies, different things like that. Does anybody have any, um, in terms of like a, a framework, um, anybody's just using somebody right now that comes in and regularly mentors, mentors on like technique or fundamentals or stuff like that? That's kind of a, that was a very unusual thing when I got to Texas and um, Tom Bennett, I, I observed him and, and he was at the University of Houston for a number of years. He was a, a disciple of Eddie Green and a lot of the daily drills and stuff and uh, he, would come in to do a clinic and in the hour and a half clinic they would spend 60 minutes on the warm-up and maybe 30 minutes on the music uh, and it was a very different thing that I had ever experienced because a clinic meant we were you know working on our musical pieces and uh, I learned a lot about how somebody could use um, how someone could use the warm-up as a framework to try to work a concept so you know Gino starting in this clinic yesterday his biggest thing that he's worried about with an exercise or something that you do is that it transfers directly to the to the piece of music and um, you know having gone through Tom's clinic um, the number of times that that we'll work on an exercise and then we'll go to, to music and he'll come back and say let's play this exercise again and then the kids say does it sound like this does it sound calm does it sound noise free does it have the same balance and blend because what I you figure out is and once the kids get to a, a place on like a concert F, 
they're not thinking so much about how the F starts anymore because it just becomes automatic. You know, it's like if I were to sit here with my hands and rotate around, you know, this is a skill that's not really hard for me to do this, you know, or the whole, you know, tap and, and rub and that. And, you know, you can do it, but a kid that's five, that's hard for them. They're not going to be able to have that conversation. Well, the F concert's the home base. So now they can focus on people to their left and to their right and the whole trio thing because the note, we take it for granted. And, you know, Tom's whole way of, of teaching a clinic was, you know, you've got a procedure and you've got tools and goals and outcomes and it's really scientific, but the gist of it is, um, you know, until they know the notes and rhythms well enough, they're not going to think about balance and blend. They're not going to think about matching the people to their left and right. Uh, and Gino's whole thing he talks about, they're not thinking about anything until they learn the notes. Stop talking to them about this and that. They got to they learn how to play the notes. And you know, that clicked for me. Yeah, you do. They're not thinking about anything until they learn the notes. You're, you're pontificating about air and, and blah, and it's, it's true. And it, you know, because it's, um, it's, and the smart music thing that we, we use with Boston, it's like, uh, it, it doesn't have a tone detector and it doesn't have a match detector and it doesn't have a this detector, but it does, it jumps on them about how to learn their notes and rhythms. So, um, you know, that I, I never would have even thought though about, uh, let's let's bring Tom in and let's spend 60 minutes on 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 warm up and technique uh, and and you know we don't do that when Gino comes in because it's you know it's a different approach we might pick one exercise and break that down in the skill and um, but I, I would encourage you if you don't have somebody that comes in and works on ensemble concepts of sound uh, or how to balance a band not just about how to shape a piece or how to make the whole suite sound good or how to make Legend of Knife River play better together. Um, that's another really valuable way to structure your clinics. You know, bring in Dick Saucedo just to talk about how to work on long tones and on Remington and on Concert F. Uh, you know, and, 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 you know, or bring Gino in just to work on breathing and lip slurs or the brass triangle uh, because it, it, it really, um, you, your, your kids, it may be a little tedious for them, um, but when the clinician leaves, you're left with some ways of approaching stuff that, that, again, you may not even know that you don't know. So that's the thing with, with the, with the warm-up clinics and that kind of stuff that, um, that ended up being really valuable. So, so when you talk about the, you know, the framework and, uh, my kids do a lot of things from Boston. Uh, sometimes it's not applicable. It doesn't work. Um, but, uh, these are just all the different things that we've pulled um, you know, if you Google Joe Dixon, if you write down that name and you just write Joe Dixon Studio, uh, you will find all of these free exercises that he's written out for all these brass players. And it's, it's, it's just everything. It's calisthenics, it's lip slurs, it's descending scale exercises. It's all free. He just gives it away. You know, and, and, and his whole thing is, is that he, uh, his student, uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew Markey's the bass trombonist in um, uh, Boston. And, um, you know, Joe is one of the most giving people, um, one of the most detailed people that I've ever met uh, in terms of how he creates stuff. And we don't use everything that he does, but again, it's, it's, a, it's another resource on somebody that's willing to talk your ear off about long tones and how that applies to music. So, um, you know, you, you geek out a little bit through that. If you can't bring somebody in, go to their website and, and, and take advantage of everything that they offer. And that, that's your clinic, you know. Um, you might not be able to. Uh, Saucedo was just talking about this in his last session. Uh, clinicians for the staff, um, and, and I'll put Gina on the spot a little bit. You know, one of the things that he manages even now with us at Cadets is, and it's one thing when you're mentoring students or you're bringing in a clinician, uh, it's another thing to have to talk to the brass staff at Boston or Cadets about our behaviors as adults. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, everybody has a boss. And it's something my dad taught me when I was young is we all have a boss and we all have rules that we have to follow. Um, but you, as if you have a staff, if you're in that situation where you've got other directors, um, you know, especially younger ones or sometimes older, um, you know, the director that, that is my assistant is, is 25 years older than I am. Uh, and we've worked together for a long time. And it's sometimes when I have to talk about um, you know, different concepts or things, because there are some places that it gets uncomfortable. So, um, but that, that constant mentoring of your teachers and your staff and your assistants, uh, I think is just as valuable as the things that you do for the kids. So, I want to talk a little bit about that. I think, um, you know, managing, managing all those personalities, I think it just comes to being upfront with them and setting your expectations. This is what we do and this is what we don't do. And uh, don't take it for granted that they can read your mind or they think it's, you know, they're going to make the right decisions. Um, 
So I think it's just all a part of communication. And, and like I said before, all a part, you know, that's how we manage, you know, if, that's how I manage my staff uh, is, you know, we lay out the expectations. These are the do's and the don'ts. This is what's required of you on a very, on a daily basis. And, and then we go from there. So I think it just all comes down to communication. And, it's, and that's it. I mean, it's, uh, it's hard sometimes. You know, if you've got a, a tech, a lot of my younger techs down on the field, um, you know, there, there's coming to a halt in the marching set, and there are kids that are clearly not evenly spaced, and it's just glaring drill errors, and one of my young instructors will stand there and just, and it resets, and there was never feedback, and there was nothing, and, and sometimes I wonder if they see it, and then I realize that they don't, and it's, it's like, well, then what do I hire you for? And then you watch them fix something else, and, you know, but it's, again, it's, the, it's that constant mentoring process. So, you know, if you're in a position where you can bring in somebody, uh, you know, I'll use an example is Wayne Downey will travel to programs around the country, and all he does is just observe staff dynamics, and he just writes up, he charges a, a lot of money to write up for a director an evaluation of how effective the director is as a manager of the program. So you're actually getting a clinic on how well you manage or set expectations or do this, and he writes up a whole thing. And you're reading things about yourself and like, wow, I really didn't define that very well, or I didn't give them a schedule, or I, I didn't do a very good job in guiding. And you know, if, if you want, Wayne will, you know, he'll step in and he'll say, you know, well, this is what we need to do, and this is the expectation of a tech. And uh, and then that gets uncomfortable because it's, um, you know, it 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 requires peers to communicate and it's easier with a kid because they're students and we're the teacher and that's it but you know the, if you can get to a place where you know, this is this is applicable to you um, you know bring in people that can help with that process so uh, other opportunities um, and, I, and I make a plug if you don't um, if you have drum major camps or student leadership training, student leadership is another great place that clinics can happen. Um, uh, SASE is kind of the main leadership thing that happens in Texas. Up here there's, there's the BOA Symposium, uh, the George Parks Academy. I mean, I think anything that you can encourage your students to go to. One of the things I like about SASE is, is that you can either send your drum majors to a camp or you can go to see them and they'll send a leadership clinician into your campus. So you have somebody that comes and visits you uh, and, and there's, again, different price points, different things, and you know, but bringing kids in to talk about leadership or kumbaya or rah-rah stuff and you know, recognizing, again, it may be things that you say every day, um, but bringing in somebody else that's new or fresh can, can definitely inject a dose of positive energy. So uh, Dr. Tim obviously has got his organization that goes on, and, uh, but there's a lot of those resources out there. And, you know, Gina and I talk about, you know, at Boston, our, our goal, you know, everybody's goal is to make the on-the-field product great. One of the best things about the team that we left with cadets uh, and it is something that we value a lot. Um, you know, George made it a priority to try to offer the kids life skills uh, and, and would do hop talks with them. And uh, sometimes they were long-winded and sometimes they were at really inopportune times. But a lot of the kids that are very loyal to cadets will talk about the fact that George invested in them as people as much as he did as players. Uh, you know, and, and that's something that, um, you know, for your program to be able to take from that, if you don't bring in uh, even if it's once a year at somebody to, to do that, that's another thing that uh, you can offer for, for your kids because it's, it's, again, you have a connection to them that the math or English or social studies teacher doesn't necessarily do. So, um, you know, bringing in someone for leadership or that kind of stuff is always good. This last piece is, and I stick this in there, um, because it, it, it's, again, it's, it's, it seems like it's common sense, but, uh, you know, something... Very important. Yeah, it, it is. But it's something, you know, if you pick somebody up and... and um, you know, you bring in a clinician, even if it's somebody that's young or someone that's new, something as courteous as having a bottle of water in the car when you go to pick them up from the airport or, uh, you know, making sure that they've got meals taken care of for the day or, you know, how do they eat? Uh, it's it, it, stuff that just gets so easily overlooked because you just take it for granted or, you know, if someone's driving in, uh, you know, even if they're your best friend and, and, you know, they've offered to come do this for free, you know, slip them 50 bucks to put in their gas tank to cover the cost of driving in and things that, that we, we, you know, that you extend that to them. And, um, you know, I love um, 
my favorite places to go back to are the ones where, our, where the kids you know, write a little note and they send something or they've signed it. And it's, it's like, I'll work for free if I know the kids are appreciative of it. And even if the director pushed them to do it, uh, I still think that that's great manners to, to send a little thank you note or, uh, or recognize that because it, it, it goes a long way towards someone wanting to come back. Or maybe they do something for free when you really need it. Um, Clinicians like to hear about how the band do. You know, if you if you bring someone in, send them a video, send them a recording. Even if you wonder if they listen to it, doesn't matter. It's you still send it. Uh, you know, on on your end, uh, payment. Uh, try to agree up front what it is so that there's no mystery. Uh, if you if you're worried about you know, if you're worried about how much to pay someone, because it's like, well, I don't know how much to pay. I mean, Gina, you say, so how much do I charge somebody? Uh, ask somebody that does it. Uh, in Texas, we, we've got all kinds of things. You know, the, the standard going rate in Texas for someone that's regular is $125 an hour. Uh, that seems like a ridiculous amount of money to make. Uh, I couldn't believe it when I started to go. I don't charge that. Uh, but but that that is a, there, there is that expectation for some people that they're going to make that kind of money, um, you know. So talk to people who have worked with the clinician before, uh, and and like I said, if you don't know, throw out a you know a hundred bucks or can I put you up in a hotel or, you know, don't be embarrassed to to offer what you can. And if you can't afford a hundred and you can't do that, say hey I can't I can't we don't have any money. Can, can I offer to come out and help and I'll take you to dinner and let's go do that? And so I say it again, you know, the money thing, whatever it is, figure it out up front, you know, and just get it out of the way and, and then make sure that wherever it is that they do get paid. If you know that you come from a district that takes a month to turn a check around, you know, just make sure at the very beginning up front the clinician goes, it will take you 30 days to get paid. Our system is very slow. Uh, because then there's no surprises, you know, and that's somebody, um, you know, everybody has been through it, they understand it, but it's just eliminating those things. Um, you know, cover the meals, cover travel expenses. It's a big one. If you need to cancel or reschedule, stuff comes up. You know, give the clinician advance notice. If you're going to do it shortly before, uh, offer to pay them for their time. They may say, no, it's okay, but at least you, you know, you've gone out of your way and stuff comes up. And, you know, we've had that happen before where I have to cancel somebody because it's just not the right time. You know, we're bringing them in and, uh, and it's like, I, I don't need a clinician right now. I need another hour of rehearsal and, and I messed up. Here's the 60 bucks. I'm sorry. We'll see you in a month. You know, and that's fine too, but just to give them that opportunity. So, you know, anything other nuts and bolts? Very good. Sweet. And then, like I said, I mean, it, um, you know, uh, our, our kids, you know, this was after the cadets won the gym ot a couple of years ago. It's like our kids said, hey, Gino's coming down. We want to do this for him. And, you know, they made him a sign and a card and that kind of stuff. And they get very excited when he comes in. And it's, uh, it becomes something that they look forward to. Uh, without even needing to be told, and um, that that will develop in time if you can get those relationships and you find some people, and they will take ownership in the program, and uh, you don't feel so lonely. If you're like me, sometimes it gets very lonely running the program. Uh, I start to, to wonder sometimes if I'm the only one that goes through stuff, and the clinician ends up being uh, as much as like a therapy session for me sometimes when they come in, even if it's just for a little bit, and uh, it's really helpful, so you know, that, uh, that's a good part of it. So always say thank you to, to Fred J. Miller. Um, they're really good with uniforms. If you need band uniforms, uh, Fred J. Miller's great, and, uh, and that's what we've got. So I've put uh, these, if you would like a copy of this or anything that you've been able to come to one of our other sessions, I have a Dropbox link that I'll share. You can have a PDF of any of these presentations. It's my email up there. Um, Gina's doing a session tomorrow morning on band sounds and getting a sound in your ear. I think it's 8.30. Yeah, it's the early one. Sorry. But uh, it's the 8.30. I did the 8.30 this morning. Uh, and then tomorrow I do, uh, I'm doing a clinic on uh, design using CTJ kind of as a basis on some of the shows that we've done and how we put things together. Uh, but it's more geared on trying to come up with a show that the football crowd likes, that also does well in BOA, that also makes your parents happy, that also makes administration happy. And how do you kind of combine all of that into one, uh, one thing? So we'll be here if there's any questions afterwards or ideas that you've got that we might include in this. But... Thank you for coming very much.